All right, so let's start solving some kinematic problems with constant acceleration. All right, so here's an example. How long does it take a car to cross a 30 meter wide intersection after the light turns green if the car accelerates from rest at the constant two meter per second square acceleration? All right, so what we do here is we, maybe like a, do a rough sketch, so you can do something like that. And then make a table of what's given to you. All right, so we are given this. So it says, how long does it take for a car to cross 30 meter wide intersection? Which means that if here's the object, you know, at the initial position, at the initial time, we can technically take that to be, you know, equals to zero. By the way, this x zero, we know we call it x naught or v naught. That's just another notation for X initial and V initial. Just sometimes you might see, you know, me using both of those. So. But in any case, so let's say we take X initial to be zero and then, then X final to be 30 meters. So that's why it's a 30 meter wide intersection means that, you know, from here to there, it's 30 meters. All right, so we also, we are told that, for example, the car starts from rest. What does it mean? Well, it means that initial velocity here is zero. And we're given the acceleration as two meter per second square. What do we want to find? How long? Well, how long means the time. What is the time? All right, so now, remember, kinematic equations are equation one, V final equals V initial plus acceleration times time. Equation two x final equals x initial plus x plus initial velocity times time plus one half of the acceleration times time square. Equation three, v final square equals v initial square plus two times acceleration times delta x. And then equation four, v fine, sorry, x final equals um, or technically this is, you know, I can write it as delta x if you want. Delta x equals v initial plus v final over two times time. All right, so those are your tools, basically. You, you just need to learn which one you can use, right, to, uh, let's say, solve the problem. All right, so we're given initial position, final position, initial velocity, and acceleration. And we want to find time. That means you want to choose the equation that is, you know, includes time, right? Equation three doesn't include time, so you can just get rid of it right now, or just forget about it right now. Then I have equation one, equation two, and equation four with time. Can I use those equations to find the time? Well, remember, if you're using an equation, you want to have the quantity that you're trying to find to be the only unknown. Equation one, time is unknown, right? We're trying to find that, but so is final velocity. We don't have final velocity. So I can't use that because there are two unknowns. Equation three, there, sorry, equation four, there is time, but there's also final velocity, which again, I can't use. So this is also, you know, we can't use. Well, equation two, well, remember one thing about equation two that was unique, it was final velocity independent. So that's our equation that we're going to go and we use this equation to solve for the time. X final equals X initial plus initial velocity times time plus one half acceleration times squared. <clears throat> now, a couple of things. X initial is zero and that's how I represent some quantity to be zero. And because V initial is zero, this entire thing also zero. That means we are simplifying to x final equals one half acceleration times t squared. Here we switch the sides. So let's say move one half a t squared to the left and x final to the right. So let's say I write it like this, for example. Because then from here, I can show that all I have to do is just multiply both sides by two, cancel that, and divide both sides by acceleration to cancel that. That means what I'm gonna get here is this t squared equals two times x final over a. Because t squared is you know, squared, 
I also then take the square root of both sides to get then t. That means t is equals to two times x final over a. All right, so that's my basically equation. All right, so let's see what I have. Is square root of two times 30 meters over two meter per second square. And plug in that to calculate the, you know, the answer, which should give me 5.5 seconds. That means car will go from X initial to X final, 30 meter wide intersection in five and a half, five and a half seconds. Here's another example. <clears throat> you have a speedboat moving at 30 meter per second, approaches a marker 100 meter ahead. The pilot slows the boat with a constant acceleration of negative 3.5 meter per second square by reducing the throttle. How long does it take the boat to reach the marker? And what is the velocity of the boat when it reaches the marker? All right, so let's see what we have. We are given, right, so let's say here's sort of like, let's say rough sketch. Here's our boat moving with initial velocity of 30 meter per second, and we put this to be x initial to be zero, and the marker is here, x final to be 100 meters. And what I know here is there is an acceleration of negative 3.5 meter per second square. And obviously, you know, the, the velocity and acceleration vectors were way, way, you know, uh, not to scale because one is 30, the other one is you know, 3.5. So it's like 10 times less should be technically. But let's say for now, we're you know, ignoring that fact. But the idea is this, velocity acceleration in the opposite direction means that the system is slowing down. All right, so let's look at then what we have. For the given information, I have this. I have initial velocity of 30 meter per second, initial position of zero, final position of 100 meter per second, sorry, 100 meters, and then acceleration of negative 3.5 meter per second square. Yes. What we wanna find is this, how long does it take for it to reach the marker? That means we wanna find the time, and then how fast it's moving there when it reaches the X final position. All right, again, what we do here is we write down our equations, okay? We write down our equation, or Try to have your note card with equations next to. So you, if you look at through the equation, again, same way, right? You're looking at the time and you look at equation one, there's a time over there, but equation one requires V final. Ignore that just like previously. See V final equals V initial plus AT. I can't have two unknowns, so not this. Second equation, X final equals X initial plus V initial T plus one half a t squared. And we look at this one and we can see, right? T, T, no V final, X final, X initial, V initial and acceleration given, perfect. That's our equation. So we go with that. So X final equals X initial plus V initial T plus one half a t squared. Now, what I do with this, I know that the only thing I have here is that this guy here is zero. So zero plus that, right? Technically then what I have here is this. Sorry, let me write those down values so you can see. So I have then um, 100 equals, then V initial is 30 times T. And this is negative, you know, half of 3.5 is 1.75 T squared. The reason I'm doing this because you might be able to see that if I rearrange this, I end up with this 1.75 T square minus 30 T plus 100 equals zero. And I want to find T. Term with T squared, term with T, term with no T, which means that in order for me to find T, I need to use quadratic equation. If you guessed it correct, then good for you. So now we need to use the quadratic equation. Equation, quadratic equation gives me this, T is equals to, remember it's negative B plus minus square root of B squared minus four AC divided by two A. This is my A, this is my B, and this is my C. 
that means it's uh, negative negative 30 plus minus square root of then negative 30 squared minus 4 times 1.75 then 100 and this whole thing divided by 2 times 1.75 all right so let's see what we get our answer gonna be if we calculate gonna give us two things just like with quadratic equation right so here we're gonna get 12.6 seconds and 4.53 seconds generally when you calculate the quadratic equation for time you get lucky you have one of them is negative other one is positive clearly time cannot be negative so you ignore that and go with the positive one but here both of them are positive both of them are you know kind of close to one another so which one is the right answer is it four seconds or 12 seconds well you have to then use a little bit of critical thinking here let's go back to the rough sketch that we have this this picture over here remember starting from here to there is 100 meters and your boat initially moving at 30 meter per second which means every second it's the first that, that means like let's say the first second that it's moving it covers 30 meters that means one second later it's right here covered 30 meters but velocity would decrease because there's acceleration what is the velocity here well, it decreases by that much but not by much it's 26.5 meter per second that means the next one second is going to cover additional 26.5 meters that means it's going to come over here which is 56.5 meters but it's going to decrease a little bit it's going to be about 21 or 22 but still you can see right it's getting closer and closer to the 100 meter mark that means wh which one is more logical for it to take 12 seconds to get to the 100 marker or 4.5 seconds because remember we already two seconds into that it's already roughly 60 meters covered so you can see right maybe another couple of minutes a couple of seconds and it's already reaching 100 marker rather than another let's say uh another 10 seconds or so so that's why here you use a little bit of critical thinking and take this number to be your you know time and kind of ignore the 12.6 seconds all right so 4.53 seconds is our time then this is part a this is part b for for part b is simple it says then what is the velocity of the boat when it reaches the marker that's easy because then i can come back to this equation one to solve for v final because it's equals to v initial plus a x times t and i have v initial which is 30 meter per second and i have acceleration negative 3.5 meter per second square and i have the time 4.53 seconds plug in everything we can get then 14.1 meter per second all right so that's my answer all right so hopefully you guys understand that sometimes when you need to solve for the time using equation two and the initial velocity is not zero then technically right technically you are stuck using quadratic equation but are you uh, not really so this is one way to solve this problem and i have the solution for you know for this problem using this but let me show you another way of doing this and this way will be you know kind of like alternative way of doing this so let me kind of clean this here because i want to leave everything else all right bear with me almost done there you go so here's what i have remember we want a time i guess i can clean this one all right so we want a time and final velocity and so and first i went into solve for time but i need to use quadratic equation because i didn't know v final one thing i can do here is this see if i go directly to part b I can solve for v final even if i don't have the time because i have an equation that doesn't need time to solve for v final and that's equation three remember v final square equals v initial square plus two times acceleration times displacement and i have those 
initial velocity, displacement, and acceleration. So technically, I can solve for the final velocity by taking this and saying that this is 30 squared plus 2 times negative 3.5 times 100. See, if I plug this into this equation, right, I can calculate the final velocity. 30 squared minus 2 times 3.5 times 100. I get 14.1 I get meter per second. That's my final velocity. Okay, then what can I do with this? Well, now if I come back to equation one, to part A, using V final equals V initial plus A times T, well, I can, I can so use this equation to solve for time because now I have this. Then you can see, right, to, to, if I rearrange, then V initial, so if I rearrange, you should be able to follow that. If I rearrange becomes this, T is equals to V final minus V initial divided by A. V final now 14.1 minus V initial of 30 divided by acceleration of negative 3.5. And if I plug in this, so 14.1 minus 30 divided by negative 3.5. What I get here is I get 4.54 seconds. Well, the other one was 4.53. This is 4.54 is more than close enough. But that's it. You can see how much easier it is if you understand how all those equations can be used and if you can use part B or you can solve for part B if, you know, even if you don't know information about part A and then go back, so do it. Nothing wrong with that. But you can see, right, instead of using all that quadratic, I just use equation three for part B. Equation one for part A is much, much simpler to go this way and you're avoiding quadratic equation. But let's say you shouldn't. Don't be afraid of quadratic equations. It's not that bad. All right, but alternative way of solving this. All right, so here's another example. <clears throat> this is a little bit more complicated because you have two things interacting with one another. All right, so you have a motorist traveling with a constant speed of 15 meters per second, passes a school crossing corner where the speed limit is about 10 meters per second. Just as the motorist passes the school crossing sign, a police officer on a motorcycle stopped there starts in pursuit with a constant acceleration of three meters per second square. How much time elapses before the officer passes the motorist, basically catches it, uh, catches him. And what is the officer's speed at that time, during that, you know, at that final position? At that, and at that time, what distance has each vehicle traveled? All right, so then let's see what we have. So think like this. So this is being the initial position. That means this is, let's say, our so our x initial, then what we have here is the, at some point, right? So let's say somewhere over here, which is, we're gonna say the x final, both of them, basically or the police officer, right? Catches the motorist. Now, generally what we have in this type of example, we have two things are basically moving. So I recommend write two different tables. So this is for the motorist, and this is for the police. So what we're given here is this. Let's say we're gonna start the timer for the motorist to be when it's passing the crossing sign. That means X initial here is zero. Same thing for the police officer because it's sitting there. X initial is zero. We know that motorist is moving with constant speed of 15 meter per second. That means motorist has a uniform motion. So that's why you see the graph for the motorist is this guy here. It's a straight line, it's, it's a uniform motion. Police officer gonna be accelerating, so it's graph here like this. So that this is when it catches. Okay, anyway, so that's what I have. So V for the motorist is 15 meters per second, it's constant. Police officer has a velocity initial of the P, right, to be zero. Why? Because police officer stopped there, that means initially is not moving, right? And then it has an acceleration of three meter per second square. Remember, when you are, when you are at rest, doesn't mean that your acceleration is zero. Remember, acceleration is not equals to the, your velocity, it's equals to change in velocity. That means it's velocity one second later minus your initial velocity. That means even if you're at rest, your acceleration is not zero because if you start moving, you're moving, you're changing your velocity, and that means that's due to the acceleration. 
Okay, so that's kind of what we have. Uh, and in a way, what we have there of this 10 meter per second speed limit is you know unimportant, just telling us that 15 meter per second for the motorist is higher than speed limit. So that means you know the police officer, I guess you know, uh, can you know let's say go and catch the motorist because he is above the speed limit. But that basically completely unimportant information for us. All right, so let's say what we want to find. We want to find this. We want to find how much time. So t for the motorist. Well, what we want to find here is also the t for the police officer, because that's the time that police officer catches. And what we have here is because both of them start the same instant. Let's say right. That means imagine motorist is moving, and as soon as it passes the the the, the school crossing sign, we start our timer, and exactly same time police officer starts speeding up after the motorist. That means those times are technically gonna be the same, but let's say what we have here is, let me put TM and TP. Also, I wanna find X of the motorist final. I, know, I don't know that, and X final for the police officer. But obviously, you know, what we have here is that's also the same, right? Because both of them cover this distance until, you know, they stop or the police officer basically catches it. They don't stop, let's say, when police officer catches. That means our idea that I want to know, let's say, X final M plus V final for the police officer, you know, at that instant, you know, let's say, at least, you know, those information that we have, we're going to see are exactly the same for both of them. Same time interval for the police and motorist, and same, the same displacement for the police and motorist. And that's how we're actually going to be able to solve the problem. Okay. That means what I have is this. T for the motorist is equal to T for the police officer. And obviously I'm talking about final time. Same way, X final for the motorist is equal to X final for the police officer. Now, I use this if I wanna find X final, for example. But I can then use this if I wanna find T. Because one of the things I can see here is this. X final, of the motorist is equal to X final of the police officer. But X final of the motorist is describing the final position of the car that is moving with constant speed. And we learned that for constant velocity, right, is basically uniform motion, X final is equals to X initial plus V times T. That's the equation for the uniform motion. That means X final for the motorist equals x initial for the motorist plus velocity of the motorist times time of the motorist. Okay. X final for the police officer, that's a non-uniform motion. And x final is given in terms of this equation, x initial plus v initial times time plus one half a t squared. That means I can say then x for the police officer is equal to X for initial for the police officer plus initial velocity of the police officer times time plus one half acceleration of the police officer times T square of the police officer. But then what I'm saying is that X final of the motorist is equals to X final of the police officer. This is X final of the motorist, which is then X initial of the motorist plus velocity of the motorist times time. Then this is equals to the X final of the police. And this is what it is x initial for the police plus v initial of the police times time plus one half axis of the police times t squared. But because tm is equals to tp, I can drop those subscripts for the time. And since x initial for both of them is zero, I can also drop those things because those are zero. Or you know, let, me do, let me do this, x initial motorist, I can let me put it like this. This is zero and this is zero. Now, what else is zero? Well, remember the police officer starts from rest. So this is zero. That means we, you know, greatly simplified our, you know, equation. Our equation becomes this. Velocity of the motorist times time equals then whatever I have left on the right side, which is one half acceleration of the police officer times T square. That means we're combining, you know, the motion equation for the motorist the motion equation for the police officer. 
Why? Because they share the same final position. They share the same final time. So I can combine them. So from here, I can simplify and I can even cancel the time. And then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna switch the sides where one half AT now is equals to VM and then T is equals to two times velocity of the motorist divided by the acceleration of the police officer and then so for T, two times 15 meter per second divided by the acceleration, which was three meter per second. So two times 15, 30, 30 over three, 10 seconds. And that's the time it takes for the police officer to catch the motorist. So 10 seconds, all right? And that's the only way to do this problem, which is looking at how we can find you know, similarities, right? Quantities that are the same for both of them, you know, then equate them and then just go ahead and you know, solve for the unknown, common unknown, in this case, the time. For part B, remember part B wanted to know how fast the, the police officer was moving at that instant. And that's basically not difficult at this, you know, let's say a particular case anymore, because remember, I can use V final of the police equals V initial of the police plus acceleration of the police times time. Because it's moving at constant acceleration, initial velocity is zero. I can say that this is just basically acceleration of the police times time, which means velocity of the police final is equals to then three meter per second squared the acceleration then times 10 seconds time interval. So it's 30 meter per second. All right, that means to, to catch the motorist, police officer at the last you know, instant of time was moving at 30 meter per second, which is technically way, way above the speed limit. So anyway, they don't get tickets, so. Uh, all right, so then for part C then, let's do this. Remember, we wanna know what, is, what was the displacement, right? How far did the police officer travel until he catches the motorist? Or how far the motorist traveled from the cross sign until the police officer can. So then technically I can use either this equation to find X final or that equation to find X final. And the question is, which one would you rather do? Which one is the easiest one? Obviously the uniform motion or the motorist because it's exactly the same for the police officer. But this one is just basically zero plus velocity of the motorist times time, which is then 15 meter per second for the velocity of the motorist times 10 seconds 150 meters. That means it traveled 150 meters until the police officer catched. All right, so that's, if you, if you use this equation, you will get exactly same value too. I recommend you guys try to do that as well. Okay, so some other things we can have would also be integrals, okay? Because one of the things we have here is some of the, you know, quantities just remember, as I said, right? So let's say when you go and look at velocity versus time graph and you want to find the area under the graph to get a displacement, you technically you know, can integrate to get that. Same thing if you want to go to the acceleration versus time graph. Acceleration versus time graph, the area under the graph is then the velocity, right? So then you can also get that. And these are some of the rules for the, the inter, in integration. So let's say, if you doing the inter integration over some function u and the u function is time dependent and it's equals to c times t to the n where c is a constant and n is a constant but an exponent so then what we get here is this so let's say you replace u with c times 10 to n t to the n and then integral integral then becomes this so c times t but then do you do n plus one that means you're adding one so that's why it's sometimes known as antiderivative Instead of doing n minus one, you're doing n plus one. But then it is divided by n plus one. So for example, if this is, let's say, three t squared. So then I'm doing integral of three t squared dt. So then this is equals to, so you tend to do, you do three times t, but then you do two plus one, and then divided by, again, n plus one, right? So two plus one. So then this becomes three times t cubed over three, okay? That means this T squared, you know, uh, became like T, T cubed over three. Then you can cancel, let's say the three if you want, so then it becomes T squared. But that's kind of what we have, right? So that means this is, you know, in terms of 
you know, taking like, let's say, antiderivative, right? So the integral is basically that. You take this 3t squared, sorry, this is cubed. So 3t, 3t cubed, 3t squared, and that becomes t cubed, okay? And the reason it's called antiderivative because think like this, if you take t cubed, and let's say take the derivative of t cubed with respect to time, what will we get? Well, we're gonna get 3t squared, right? Exactly what we had before. That means you take 3t squared, take, take, take the integral of that, you're gonna get the same thing that, you know, you were at the derivative of before. Okay, anyway, so this is technically the only thing you need to, you know, remind yourself, right? You can review and if you haven't done this, you know, maybe look at it and, you know, try to follow, let's say the example that I have, you know, on the next slide. So if a particle's velocity is described by a function v of x equals kt squared, meter per second, where k is a constant and t is in seconds. The particle's position at t1 is zero, uh, at t1, which t1 equals zero is x1 equals negative nine meters. That means at t initial time, right, position of the object is negative nine meters. At t2, which is three seconds, the particle is now at x2 equals nine meters. What we wanna do here is we wanna determine what is the value of that constant k. Be sure to include proper units. And in this case, it's constant k is not a spring constant or anything like that, it's just some constant, okay? Some constant k, it has units and things like that, and we're gonna find that, but you know, we wanna just find what it is, okay? Okay, so then what we need to do here is this. So let's write down what we're given, vx equals k times t squared, meter per second. Remember, so technically then we're given this. So we're given x1 equals negative nine meters. We're given x2 as nine meters, positive nine meters. And this is a t1, which is zero. And this is a t2, which is three seconds. That means we're technically given our, you know, displacement. And if you, if you remember, one of the things here is velocity is then dx dt, right? Velocity equals the rule of position as a function of time. Now, one thing I can do here is this. So dx dt, remember is equals to vx. And then I'm gonna multiply both sides by dx, which then cancel it here. Sorry, not dx, but dt, sorry, dt. Then let's say, you know, it cancels from here. That means what I have here is then dx equals vx times dt. Okay, then if I take the integral of both sides, uh, what I have here is this. So let's look at then, this is basically left-hand side. So the left-hand side, we end up with this. So then I have like an integral of dx going from x1 to x2. This is simple because integral of dx uh, is basically nothing but x in terms of then x1 to x2. And if I you know plug in this, I'm gonna get then x2 minus x1, which is remember is displacement. So x2 here is nine meters minus x1, which is negative nine meters. So I get, you know, uh, 18 meters. So 18 meters for the displacement. All right, so um, from here, I go now to the right-hand side where I have then integral of vx dx, sorry, dt. All right, so now I take and replace vx with this, integral of kt squared going from t1 to t2, dt. So then k is a constant, I can remove that. So then it becomes integral going from zero to three seconds. Then I have t squared dt. Okay, then k, remember then what I end up with is this, right? Is t, two plus one, so t cubed over, you know, two plus one, which is three, then this is from zero to three. Okay. And then if I plug in this, right, so it's gonna be then k times three cubed over three, right? And that's gonna basically give me um, nine k, right, so nine k. All right. So, um, but also if I'm keeping the units, Remember, this is three second cubed. So that means this is basically second cubed as a unit. So nine, so nine sec, nine K second cubed. So that's what I have. Because then 
I can go back to my original equation where I say that left side, which is 18 meters, is equal to the right side, which is 9k second cubed. And then from here, I can solve for k, which will be then 18 meters over 9 seconds cubed. And this just will give me 2 meter per second cubed. And that's the value for constant k along with its units. Okay. All right. Now we are moving to um, what we call a free fall. This free fall is non uniform motion of the object that's specifically moving under the gravity of Earth, under the influence of the gravity of Earth. That means the object, let's say anything you're holding, right? Take a, take a pencil or something like light, hold it and let go. You will see it's, you know, it's gonna fall. It's gonna fall down. Or if you throw something up, it's gonna slow down, stop and come back, you know, and fall down again. That means every time object is moving due to the influence of Earth gravity, we call that a free falling object or free, you know, free fall, okay? Free fall motion. And Galileo, Galileo Galilei was the first one who actually did some empirical measurements uh, for the free fall, you know, uh, motion. He actually was able to verify that objects not just move under gravity, but they accelerate under gravity. And when they accelerate, he was able to even measure that rate of acceleration, right? Rate of a change in velocity. He was able to do very careful measurements and calculate that acceleration due to gravity is always roughly 9.8 meter per second square. Okay, so this acceleration is in a vertical direction because object, let's say when you let them go, right, they fall you know, in a negative direction, negative y direction, taking up to be positive y. And this acceleration is a magnitude of 9.8 meter per second square and always pointing in a negative direction. So let's say negative j head direction. So now this 9.8 meter per second we, you know, this is basically a constant quantity and it's fixed. That means the, in the, for this motion, acceleration is fixed. We can't do anything about it. It's not negotiable. Acceleration due to gravity is 9.8. We're always going to be using that if we know that the motion is free fall. So we define this to be lowercase g, which is the gravitational acceleration. G, lowercase g, is the acceleration due to gravity. So it's acceleration, meter square. So then what we can say here is this, then Ay is equals to negative G because G itself is 9.8, negative indicates downward direction. All right, so free falling object is any object moving freely under the influence of gravity alone, neglecting air resistance. Because technically if you right now take two objects, let's say a pencil and a just piece of paper, right? So let's say a napkin or something like that and you drop them, you will see the, 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 you know, let's say pencil will go hit the ground and the napkin slowly will go and hit the ground, you know, eventually. What's going on? Is the gravity different for each of them? No, the gravity effect, right? This 9.8 is the same for both of them, but air molecules affect the napkin much more than let's say a pencil because of its size or shape. All right, because napkin has a bigger surface area, right? And you know, when it's falling, air resistance much greater. If I do the same experiment in vacuum, both will go and hit the ground exactly the same time. And that's what you have over here in this, in this picture. You have the apple and the feather. If you drop them right now in your room, apple gonna hit the ground, feather slowly goes and hits the ground. In vacuum, they both go down and hit the ground exactly the same time. So that's kind of what we have. That means we take that um, a freely object can be dropped, which means released from rest, thrown downward or thrown upward. Because as soon as it leaves your hand, doesn't matter upward or downward or just releasing, gravity takes over and changes the motion of the object. And remember this acceleration always acting downward. So if your initial velocity is upward and acceleration is downward, well, you're gonna slow down eventually until you stop. And then what's gonna happen is then after that, you're just basically gonna drop pretty much. That means any object that thrown upward gonna go up eventually slow down, stop. And then you can think of like from that height, it's nothing but the object B is basically dropped, okay? 
So an object in free fall can be modeled as a particle under constant acceleration. And that's good. That means now we are able to go back and use all of those equations. So actually, let me give you those equations here because I have room over here. So one thing we can do here is then, because the acceleration is constant, I can then assume this. Acceleration is vertically equals to negative G. Okay, where then G is 9.8, negative just the direction downward. So then I'm gonna give you kinematic equation for constant acceleration, but modified for free fall. V final, now I'm gonna put Y, I, you know, the subscript because it's a vertical motion, V final Y equals V initial Y. Then remember it's, it's plus a t, a y t, but I'm replacing a y with negative g. So it becomes negative g t. Equation two, y final equals y initial plus v initial t minus one half g t square. Equation three, v final y square equals v initial y square plus two times acceleration, but you know, replacing with negative g times then delta y and equation four, delta y equals v final y plus v initial y divided by two times time. That means those are only for the free fall. Why? Because I replaced a y with a negative g. Only for the free fall, acceleration is equal to negative g. All right, so then we can use those equations, you know, to solve some problems. Let's start from this one. <clears throat> So an African antelope known as a springbok will occasionally jump straight up in the air. A movement known as a prank. Speed when leaving the ground can be as high as seven meter per second. If a springbok leaves the ground at seven meter per second, how much time will it take for it to reach the highest point? Highest point will be, let's say if this is a springbok, give itself some initial velocity in the y direction it's gonna go up, but remember, always, right away, there's acceleration negative G. Every time, even if the spring bar is not jumping, this acceleration is there. So then, because velocity is up, acceleration down, the spring bar gonna slow down, slow down, slow down until it stops at this, you know, let's take this as point A to the ground. It stops at point B. What is point B? Point B is the highest point, right? So the highest point which means that, or sometimes I call it maximum height. So the, that's the point where it's gonna stop and then, you know, drop down. Okay, so now when it's gonna drop down, let's say it's gonna go come back and hit the ground at point C, let's say. The question is how much time will it take to reach the highest point? Okay, so if you read the problem, it seems like the only thing we're given is that it, go, it jumps at seven meter per second. So then if I'm writing this in terms of my given information, I have this. The initial y is seven meter per second. But what else? Well, I also know that because it's a free fall, a y equals negative g. Well, what else? Well, I can take then, for example, y a position to be my initial and set it to zero. And then I can then take this. If point b is my final point, which is my highest point or my maximum height, then velocity there is always zero. So velocity y there is always zero. And that's given at the maximum height or highest point in a vertical direction, any object under the free fall is not moving or it doesn't have a vertical velocity. So then what we wanna find here is this, how much time to go from A to B? Well, given all of those things, then I can actually solve using equation one. V final, which is VB, equals V initial, which is VA, minus gt, modified equation. Because vb is zero, va here is, you know, seven meter per second, minus 9.8 times t, I can then just rearrange and solve for t in this particular equation, I'm gonna get 1.4 seconds. Okay, because it's gonna be t is equals to seven meter per second over 9.8, v initial over g. All right, so part b. This was part A. Part B says, how long will it stay in the air? Going up and going down. Well, one of the things we have here is this. If it starts from point A, goes to point B, and it took 1.4 seconds, and then it's after that it's coming down, 
if it comes down to exactly same height as your starting point, which is let's say A and C are exactly the same positions, vertical, then the time it takes to go from A to B is exactly the same from B to C. That means then the total time will be time from A to B plus time from B to C, which is basically two times the time up. That means this will be then roughly 2.8 seconds. All right. So actually I made a mistake here. I apologize. This is 0.7 seconds let's say, and this is point 1.4 seconds. I just doubled that, but this is actually, you know, I just looked at the wrong place. So this is 0.7 going from A to B, and then going from A to B, then coming back from B to C is 1.4 seconds, because if it takes 0.7 seven seconds to go from A to B, it takes another 0.7 seconds to go from B to C, and the total is double that. <coughs> All right, so then the C here is, when it returns to Earth, how fast will it be moving? All right, so let's, let's, let's do this then. I'm gonna consider motion from A to C. What I'm gonna do here is then I wanna find final velocity, which is velocity at C. And I'm gonna use equation one, which is then velocity at A minus G times T. Well, I know that velocity at A was seven meter per second minus then 9.8 times the T, but this is the total T because it's from A to C, that's 1.4 seconds. And here's what I'm gonna get, velocity at C is equals to negative seven meter per second. Does that sound you know, familiar? Well, initial velocity upward was seven meter per second, and now final velocity when it hits the ground is negative seven meter per second. And that's not a coincidence. Actually, because v A and C are exactly same you know, vertical positions, right? The, the speed that you start upward, when you come back and hit the ground, you hit the ground with the same initial velocity, but in opposite direction. Basically the speed is the same, but velocity has a different direction because you're now hitting it coming down. And never ever put the final velocity when it hits the ground as zero, because there's no such thing as, you know, final velocity is zero. We're not talking about when it comes down, hits the ground and stops. No, we're talking about impact speed. I mean, you hit the ground with some impact speed, right? So that's why let's say, you know, you can make a dent or something like that, right? So because you are hitting with some speed. So that's the speed we're talking about, impact speed. All right, so one more example. Spud Webb, height of 5'7", was one of the shortest basketball players to play in the NBA. All right, that means I have a chance. All right, so, but, but he had an impressive vertical leap. He was repeatedly able to jump 110 centimeters off the ground. So to, Jump this high, with what speed would he leave the ground? All right, so that means take the spot web to be a particle. Then assuming that it's gonna jump up with some initial velocity. One thing we know that when it jumps, the highest speed, let's say highest position, which is position B, is 1.1 meter above the lowest position, which is then set this to zero. That means we are given the displacement, how high it jumps. That means if I'm writing my given information, it will be this, YA is zero, YB is 1.10 meters. I also know that AY is equals to negative G, right? That's already in our information and technically I'm done. There's nothing else. So what I wanna find here is V initial in a Y direction. All right, but there's one other thing I have, which is what, can you think of it? velocity at that point B. Velocity at point B is zero. Remember, because that's the highest point, right? It jumps that high. It stops there, then drop down. Now, using all of those, I wanna find V initial. You can see, right, with, in my given table, right, in, in, the, in that column, I'm missing time. But I wanna find initial velocity. But I don't need time because there is a time independent equation. That was V final square, equal in the y direction, v initial square in the y direction, minus two times g delta y. I can use this equation to solve for this guy if I have v final, which I do, delta displacement, which I do, and acceleration, that's it. So zero equals v initial y square minus two g delta y. Then I move this, you know, 
uh, so rearrange. So V initial Y square equals 2G delta Y. And then they take the square root of both sides. So V initial Y, which is basically VA, right? Technically. Then it equals to two times 9.8 times 1.1 meters. And if I calculate, I'm gonna get 4.6 meters per second. So that means the initial speed is 4.6 meter per second, which is quite high, but not as high as the antelope, right? The antelope had seven meter per second. So you can try, you can try to maybe calculate how high the antelope can jump. What will be the highest point? We didn't do that in the previous example, but you can do that. All right. So we have our last example. So we're done with everything. So it's last example. So we have a ball that starts from rest and accelerates 0.5 meter per second square while moving down an incline plane nine meter long. All right, so you can see that this is, you know, something different. So we're not something that's going up or down or something that's going in a straight line. This is actually something moving in an incline plane. We haven't talked about that, but here's a nice example that I can use to explain, let's say, motion along the incline. So think like this. So here's the incline plane, right? So here's an object starting from here and goes down and we're saying that this plane here is nine, nine meter long. So let's say this distance here is nine meter long. Okay. Now, when it reaches the bottom, the ball rolls up another plane where it comes to rest after moving 15 meter on that plane. All right, so let's say there's another plane right there. Okay. That means it goes up and let's say reaches you know, 15 meter, much higher, right? Uh, comes to rest, that means it stops over there. Let's call this point A, right? Maybe like, let's say here is point B, and then here's point C. All right. What is the speed of the ball at the bottom of the first plane? Well, we wanna find what is VB, okay. All right, so then during the, what time interval does the ball roll down? the first plane. That means how long does it take to go from A to B? What is the acceleration along the second plane? And what is the ball speed eight meter along the second plane? All right, so let's see what we have. So let's look at sort of like, what, what are we given? So what are we given? Okay. So here we are given that we have an acceleration, let's call this A1 because it's the first, first incline. So A1 is equals to 0.5 meter per second square, 0.500 meter per second square. We also know that V1 initial, so I'm gonna call this, or, or I can say this, VA, right? Which is velocity at point A is zero. Also, we know that velocity at point C is zero because it stops over there too. It's, it's at rest for both of them. Now I know that, for example, then delta Y1, sorry, Delta X1, which is gonna be then, I'm gonna call this Delta X1 is nine meters. And this Delta X2 here is 15 meters. So nine meters, then um, Delta X2 is 15 meters. All right, so. So, all right. And what I wanna find here, for example, VB and things like that. Okay, so let's do this. First, I'm gonna look at this motion. And one of the things we do here in incline problems, we do this. See, if I have this coordinate system, then technically the black, uh, this, this, this ball going down, you know, incline have, has a two dimensional motion. But instead of that, what I'm gonna do here is this. I'm going to tilt my coordinate system. I'm gonna tilt it such that my X is along the incline and Y is perpendicular to incline. That means whenever the object now going down an incline, it has a one dimensional motion. And then here too, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna tilt this my in, you know, coordinate system such that it's going up an incline, but it's going only along the X axis. So it's again, one dimensional. Generally that's the, you know, there is angle theta one, theta two, for example, those are the things that also play into role. And the acceleration for the incline was discovered by Galileo to be G times sine of theta. All right, G times sine of theta. But we're actually given that acceleration, right? So we don't have to calculate that because we're not given theta. But you know, if we, if we were given theta, we would be able to calculate that acceleration. But for us, 
we already given that acceleration one is 0.5. That means, you know, we, we have that. But what I have here is this, when the ball goes from A to B, it's going down an incline. And if I might tilt, if I tilt my coordinate system, that just becomes one dimensional motion. Object starts from rest, going down, covers nine meters, and there's acceleration. And I wanna find how fast it's moving at the bottom. See, I don't have any information about time. And I don't need that because there is this equation three, right? Which is VB squared equals VA squared plus two times acceleration times delta X. I can just use this because then VB is equals to square root of VA is zero plus then two times 0.5 meter per second square times nine meters. Then I can find VB to be three meters per second. That's it. Equation two gives me the speed at point B. This was part A. Part B tells me this. During what time interval does the ball roll down the first plane? Which means how long does it take to go from A to B? Well, again, I mean, uh, no big deal because uh, what I can do here is I can use equation, you know, two, or I can use equation four, or I can use equation one for that matter to solve for this. See, in my solution, I have equation two, but I'm gonna show you equation one. V final, which is VB equals V initial, VA plus 2A, sorry, plus A times T. Well, in this case, you can see, right? T is equals to VB minus VA over A. That's it. VB here is three meter per second. VA is zero. So then divided by acceleration, which is 0.5. But what is 0.5? Just basically one half, right? And then three over one half is then six seconds. Exactly same thing I have in my solutions. All right, so then let's see what we have for part C. All right, so part C, I need more room for this. So I'm gonna just go ahead and clean this up over here a little bit. Part C is asking this, what is the acceleration along the second plane? All right, so let's see what we have. The idea is that VB, which is three meter per second velocity when it's coming down, then the same speed is gonna be true for when it's going up the ink second incline. That means, you know, I can say then VB is equal to three meter per second. That's the initial velocity when it's going up. Now that I know that also the final velocity VC is equals to zero, and I know that Delta X here is 15 meters, I can then use this to solve for the acceleration. Well, I don't have any time about, you know, time information, but it's okay. We have this good old, you know, equation three. V final, which is VC square equals V initial VB square plus two times acceleration time Delta X. That's it. That means now I can use this to find the acceleration. In this case, what I have here is then this guy here is zero, right? That means it's zero is equals to VB square plus two times acceleration over Delta X. That means if I rearrange, I have then acceleration equals to Right, if basically, you know, if I rearrange, it's gonna be then um, negative VB square over two times delta X, okay? So VB is three meter per second, delta X is 15 meters. If I plug in, I'm gonna get negative three meter per second square. And that's the acceleration for the second plane. Let's call this A2, all right? So that's the acceleration for the second plane. Then the very last part is asking this. It's asking, what is the ball? What is the ball speed eight meters along the second plane? All right, so now what I have is this. That means maybe somewhere over here, right? So eight meters, let's say right here. How fast it's moving over here? Because I know here it's zero, but over here some X, you know, final to be eight meters, I don't know what it is. But no big deal because I have everything else. I have initial speed, which is at VB, three meter per second. Now I have acceleration, which is negative three meter per second square. And I have the position, you know, all the, the, all the displacement you can say, right? And the displacement in this case here is eight meters, right? That means again, all I have to do here is, seems like everything in this, you know, problem using equation three, because, you know, no time, you know, information. So I can say, you know, v, you know, velocity 
at this point, I don't know, let's call this point D. So that point D is equal to initial velocity, which is velocity at point B, square, then plus two times acceleration times delta X, and take the square root of both sides, which will give me then VD, right? So this will be then square root of three meter per second square plus two times negative three for the acceleration and then the eight meters for the displacement. To calculate, I'm gonna get 2.05 meter per second. All right, that means when it reaches here, it's moving at 2.05 meter per second. All right, that's it for this chapter. So go ahead and watch it and we discuss it in the class.